Ladies and gentlemen, warm welcome. My name is Edith Good, and I'm delighted to moderate this panel discussion. Uh, we have a very ambitious goal today. We will have about an hour to unpack the role of the cities in the 21st century and what local autonomies could do to reverse autocratic trend on the national level. Um, without further ado, I would like to introduce our distinguished panel. Uh, we have four mayor, uh, mayors of uh, Visegrad capitals with us here today. Um, Matusz Valo, very close uh, to us here in Bratislava. Uh, Gerge Karácsony, joining us from Budapest. Zdenek Rib in Prague. And Rafał Czaskowski in Warsaw. Um, and early in the morning, Nina Hatchigan, who is in Los Angeles. Welcome, everyone. Um, one of the reasons why we are here today is, is the Pact of the Free Cities, which became a very strong buzzword in the last couple of months, uh, which is a cooperative platform established by the Visegrad Corporation, um, like set up by the, the Visegrad Capital's mayors, to strengthen democracy, to counterbalance the illiberal national governance, and to um, get more direct funds from the European Union, among others. So let, let me just start with uh, Mr. Rafał Czaskowski. Um, since Poland is one of the most decentralized country within the, the European Union and um, within the V4 group as well, um, Polish local governance has very significant political power, uh, although the law and justice government have been trying to sort of curb this uh, somewhat in the last couple of years. And so what exactly are you aiming to achieve uh, from, this, uh, from this cooperation of the Pact of Free Cities? Hello, it's wonderful to be uh, with you and to discuss such a topical issue. Well, I, I'll start with, with this, you know, the strength of, of, of Polish democracy also resides in a very strong self-government. And uh, this is one of the secrets of our success of the past 30 years, that we devolved power and that uh, regions and cities carry quite a lot of clout. For example, when it comes to distributing EU money, I mean, a lot of money is, is being used by the cities and we have quite a lot of prerogatives when it comes to education, when it comes to health, uh, when it comes to uh, running our cities. Uh, and of course, you know, when we see the wave of populism in, in Poland, uh, it turns out that while most of the uh, institutions are now, uh, mob first of all, you know, monopolized by the conservative government and they decided to paralyze some of the independent institutions, I mean, the strength still resides in local government, which is mostly in the hands of the opposition. That's why we decided to cooperate in Poland in order to strengthen um, uh, self-government, but we also decided to, uh, to cooperate with other sister cities in our region because, unfortunately, when uh, my um, party was in power, the V4, Visegrad 4, was trying to work together but propose constructive solutions. Now it is in a defensive mode. That's why we decided to cooperate. First of all, to exchange uh, our experiences and do good benchmarking uh, when uh, we are actually presenting and then fighting for our priorities such as climate change, uh, such as making our cities more friendly, uh, such as uh, helping our seniors and our disabled people. But we also want to uh, stress that, you know, the face of uh, Central and Eastern Europe can be different, that uh, there are quite a lot of political powers, uh, especially in local government, which stand for values, openness, transparency, tolerance and so on. And that's why we cooperate together in order to show that face to the outer world, to increase the cooperation between the cities and to achieve our priorities better in a cooperation where we try to lobby also the European institutions uh, when it comes to coming up with uh, solutions that are dear to our heart, such as, for example, direct financing of the initiatives taken by the European cities from the European institutions. Thank you. It will be very interesting to see whether uh, this type of initiative will help to reverse or to sort of prevent the, the further proliferation of LGBTQ zones, for instance, in Poland, which is now covering one third of, of, of the territory of the country, as far as I'm concerned. Um, but now I would like to go on with uh, Mr. Karacsony. Um, because Hungary is a textbook case of, of uh, top-down centralization and uh, the urban government has been doing everything in order to weaken local autonomies 
in the last 10 years. So yesterday you have sent a letter to the EU institutions asking for direct access uh, to the recovery fund so that local municipalities can somewhat circumvent um, the national uh, government. And you're making great lobbying efforts here during the times when the Hungarian government is threatening the EU budget negotiations with a veto. So what exactly do you expect? Uh, things, how, how things are going to develop in this matter? And what sort of, um, like, to what extent a city like Budapest could mark, leave a mark on, on the EU budget negotiation? Üdvözlök mindenkit, nagyon örülök, hogy itt lehetek és beszélgetünk. Really Indeed, Hungary is a fairly decentralized country, and uh, therefore, uh, and we can say that uh, municipal powers have been uh, uh, infringed lately. However, municipalities, local governments, and uh, the opposition of the local governments with the central government uh, came about with the municipal elections last year, where in Budapest and the major cities, the opposition won the elections. Actually, we're talking about two different political visions, uh, two different political stances and attitude. Uh, this is uh, the opposition in Hungary of local governments and the central government. Local governments are much more committed uh, in terms of uh, uh, decreasing uh, social injustice, uh, climate uh, changes, uh, than the Hungarian government. And it's very much uh, inside of uh, uh, social inclusion. And also our views concerning the European Union are different compared to that of the central government. Now, the Visegrad region following the collapse of communism meant a new tide of liberty and freedom in the European Union. Uh, this was just a, a renewal of democracy. Today, however, what we see rather is uh, that uh, we're just uh, turning our backs uh, to uh, that on the level of national governments and the V4s are rather um, blocking um, European processes instead of being pioneers in this respect. There is also an ambiguity because uh, we are um, on the border of the European Union, therefore we would naturally be interested in a stronger European Union. A stronger European Union uh, which is ensuring more funding uh, for the emerging countries. And uh, in these countries where the traditions of democracy are not deeply rooted, or not that deeply rooted, it would be more important to ensure um, uh, the rule of law. But the national governments not because of ideological reasons, but rather power-related reasons, uh, want to avoid these European um, co commitments. When it was uh, approximately just a year ago that I became a mayor of Budapest, one of my first initiative was to draw the attention of Europe to the fact that there is another phenomenon here, that in uh, major cities, large cities, there are progressive and pro-European leaders. And uh, late last year, together with the uh, other V4 capital mayors, we created uh, the Pact of uh, Free Cities uh, in order to send clear signals to the European Union that this region has another face as well. And indeed, one of our objectives uh, is and has been to increase the direct funding of uh, these uh, cities or municipalities, because not to the same extent, but we're all suffering from the fact that our national governments consider us uh, as political enemies instead of opponents, uh, so political enemies. This, in vain, we try to consider them as allies. Their logics is rather, uh, are rather power-related logics, and uh, they uh, also see that we are showing a different face and we are, uh, we are um, showing an alternative vis-a-vis uh, -vis the central governments. And their power interest is very simple. They don't want this alternative to be um, a valid alternative uh, that could be a fair choice, a different choice. But I think it is not only in this region and not only in not only because of these uh, power uh, considerations that we need to strengthen uh, the participatory decision making and the municipalities, because Europe has been faced with problems which could not be tackled effectively without connecting and joining forces with municipalities and with municipal governments. The democratic 
there's a problem with democracy, democratic problem, the democratic uh, legitimation uh, concerning the decision making within the European Union. In vain would Europe like to progress and go forward uh, in changing um, the current status unless uh, they feel that the citizens, the inhabitants, are really backing them up and following them in these initiatives. Cities can represent a more democratic form of governance because they are simply because they are much closer to the uh, population and the global objectives of the European Union, whether it's climate related, whether it's housing related. These could be brought closer to the pe to people themselves, I mean to the citizens. I'm really delighted for the fact that the European Union would like to um, manage this economic crisis differently compared to well, as it used to be in 2008. Hungarian democracy actually was uh, just nearly collapsed because of uh, the, uh, uh, the austerity measures in 2008 and uh, the Victory of populists was a result, uh, basically, of those austerity measures back in 2008. Now the European Union is uh, um, offering huge funding uh, to nations and to countries uh, to get through the crisis, and they also help uh, the Green Deal um, and the Green Transition, but this can only be successful if uh, they have the cities and the alliance of cities and municipalities behind them, not only in our region, but in the entire European Union. Thank you. So, as you might have noticed, that Mr. Karacsony is uh, speaking in Hungarian with a simultaneous translation coming from his team there in Budapest, and ho we're truly hoping that it's going to go very smooth uh, during our discussion. But now uh, I'll, I'll go on with uh, Mr. Valo, and I'll also like to come to you to demonstrate that this region is far from being homogeneous when it's come to like illiberalism and the configuration between the national government and uh, the local governments. Um, so, um, could you please like share us uh, share, share some ideas with us, like how this new configuration on, on a domestic level could could help Bratislava to achieve the same goal within the Pact of Free Cities? Right now, that the opposition has won the elections recently, and there is a quite like it seems to be there is a quite a s established or esteemed um, relationship between Bratislava and and the new government. Yes, thank you very much. And again, a warm welcome for all of you, even if we are in virtual space. Uh, the conference Sajik is, is happening. Uh, uh, Sajik, sorry. The conference is, is happening in Bratislava. So, uh, so uh, once again, welcome. Uh, I mean, uh, Globsec is a conference which is also showing uh, the fact that the democracy is doing well in Bratislava, in Slovakia. Uh, our government is moving, I hope, and I, I, I can see it in a different direction uh, and uh, definitely uh, away from uh, authoritarian uh, tendencies. And I, I feel uh, in, this, uh, in this we are uh, from February uh, this year different than uh, Hungarian or Poland. Uh, what, what is very important to me is to uh, stress out that Mm, we are very. We need, of course, our national government uh, in terms of finances, uh, and uh, you know, also in terms of all other different things. Uh, my colleagues know very well. But what I'm trying to do, and why I'm so happy to be a part of, of the, our pact of free cities, is that we is I think is believe to create some kind of other different network, some new network, uh, not only network of national governments, of states, but also of the cities. And my colleague already mentioned it. I'm not going to repeat themselves. They are very good in explaining it. Uh, uh, we are cities where all the mayors are liberal. We are absolutely pro-EU. We know uh, what are our values and even if last few months this is also happening in slovakia before it wasn't like that and and i'm i'm happy that um uh, in in the central europe and i hope this network is going to be bigger it's it's uh, it was born and it's happening in another network of which can in a way uh, help democracy 
Thank you very much. Uh, so let's put it into a bit of a more global transatlantic perspective, and we are very lucky to have Ambassador Nina Hatchigan with us. Um, your city is pushing uh, the Trump administration to reimburse local uh, governments uh, for the revenue that they lost due to the coronavirus uh, pandemic. And, and local governments in general are bleeding revenues because of, because of this global crisis. So could you please share with us what can a city like Los Angeles do to prevent a federal administration overlooking local spending preferences? Thank you, and thanks so much for having me here. It's an honor to be on a panel with these incredibly exciting uh, mayors, and I just want them to know that uh, many of us in the United States are paying attention uh, to the Pact of Free Cities. It's very exciting. We see your bravery, um, and, uh, and we can identify with you because we also are living in a, uh, in a country that's been a long-standing democracy that is showing some real authoritarian tendencies uh, lately. And uh, most cities and many states like California are profoundly disagree with many of the things that the Trump administration uh, is doing and has done, um, especially on climate policy, on his uh, targeting of immigrants who make up a majority of our city and a huge economic engine for us, not to mention you know, our friends and our neighbors um, and, our, and our very residents, um, and also his stoking of, of racial hatred um, and many other things, uh, you know, being a foreign policy person, <laughs> most of what he's done on foreign policy, I don't agree with. Um, but in terms of your question about uh, funding, so uh, we were able to get funding, um, the whole country, because uh, Congress is controlled, um, it is split in its control. So half of uh, the, the House of Representatives is controlled by the Democrats and the Senate is controlled by the Republicans. But because uh, Democrats were elected in 2018 in such large numbers, um, which many took to be a rebuke of, of Trump administration policies, we were able to get a large stimulus package. And that was uh, critical because the federal government wasn't dealing with COVID. We were dealing with COVID. So we had to set up testing ourselves and feed seniors and house the homeless and you know many, many programs, um, contact tracing, the whole thing. So we were able to get federal monies for that. Now, as you point out, we are um, we are uh, we are hurting again, and it doesn't look like the Congress is going to be able to pass um, a stimulus package. But you know, our mayor is on the phone uh, with uh, federal leaders all the time. The, the cities in in the U.S. get together and they together lobby the federal government. Um, we don't have any magic, um, you know, levers, but we uh, but we use the power of our persuasion and. The good news is that you know we're off, we often do that in a bipartisan way. That Republican mayors are also wanting uh, funds for their citizens. Um, so in this case, everything is wrapped up in election politics. Uh, so it's very difficult to make any progress. Thank you. I would like to get back to you later on the issue of expanding the economic ties of the city of Los Angeles on a global scale, and how could that help you in terms of uh, combating uh, the pandemic uh, crisis. Uh, but right now, last but not least, uh, Mr. Hrib, uh, your country is also in a um, in, um, sort of an election campaign, or it has been, because you have uh, regional and senate elections, and um, your party just came a second, like biggest oppositional party during this. Uh, and so how does this battle between uh, the Pirate Party and the governing party, uh, how does it impact the finances of Prague? Did you also sort of experiment like government directing funds from, from the capital or like in Budapest? Or please just share some uh, ideas with us. Yes, well, uh, thank you also for inviting me to this exciting panel. I'm really sorry that I was not able to come uh, physically to Bratislava. Unfortunately, the situation about COVID-19 is getting worse right now in Prague and whole Czech Republic. So I have to stay here. However, um, regarding your question, uh, right now, this thing that you're describing is not exactly happening in Czech Republic, but there is a similar process ongoing. The problem is that we're facing this uh, failure of a populist uh, leadership in, uh, uh, in a live stream, to say so. Because, for example, 
when the government wants to help someone, they are basically doing it uh, in a way that affects the funding of the cities and regions as a side effect, basically. If they do something with the taxes, like lowering the taxes, uh, the result, the net result is that the cities and the regions will get less money. And the compensation, there was some compensation on the level of the cities and villages and towns. However, there were no compensation on the level of the regions, which affects the Prague as well, because we are both the city and the region from the formal perspective of the Czech law. And, well, it affects all the regions as well, but other regions have got other sources of the money, uh, for example, for the uh, road infrastructure and so on. So uh, the process is not a direct one. That was an attempt, however, to uh, replace this mechanism where the cities and towns and villages got the money directly from the taxes with a sort of uh, subsidy mechanism, whereas the central government would decide where the money would go. But the, we have, of course, opposed this as the mayors of the Czech cities. Uh, this was something that was completely unacceptable because that means two things. First of all, the central government would decide on where the money would go. And of course, they do not understand the local problems. And the second thing is that we think that there could be also situations where there would be formal really formal problems with the subsidies and this could lead to also a way how to criminalize the mayors of the cities, the towns and villages who are on the opposite side of the political spectrum from the central government, for example. Thank you. Just a very brief follow-up question. Uh, there is an ongoing investigation against the Prime Minister of Chechnya, uh, Mr. Babish, who is accused of fraudulent uh, misuse of EU funds. Uh, how could that impact the funding, uh, like the EU fundings in general? I mean, what do you expect if it's going to end badly for the Prime Minister? Uh, do you expect more EU fund would be channeled towards local governments? Well, I have to say that this situation to be resolved is taking quite a lot of time and uh, I hope it will be resolved soon. And uh, well, from my point of view, the situation is very clear. There is a huge conflict on, of interest uh, directly in the person of the prime minister. Uh, and actually, there is also one minister in Czech government who is having a similar problem. Uh, I believe that this situation will be resolved soon by the European Union and uh, that the result will be that the companies who are owned, well, right now indirectly, but definitely owned by the Prime Minister of Czech Republic, uh, will not get the subsidies from EU. It's that simple. So I hope the Czech Republic will be able to use this fund in a different way. Thank you. At this point, I'd like to ask uh, the audience if there are any questions, please feel free to jump in. Um, just try to keep it brief because our colleague over there, she's going to hold a microphone for uh, COVID related issues. Please don't be shy. Okay, so you keep thinking. Please be prepared for the for the next round, and I'm going to get back to um, actually to all of you, all the speakers, with the same question about um, this issue of extreme polarization when it comes to big cities and smaller settlements. Uh, it's I think it's a crucial issue both in Central and Eastern Europe, but also in the United States. Maybe less um, maybe less in like where Madam Ambassador is uh, coming from, like South California, uh, it's less of an issue. Um, so based, based on your international experience, uh, how could you uh, like, like 
depict or can you share some best practices with us on how uh, local governments could address this changing urban rural sort of playing? Is that to me? Yes, thank you. Oh, sorry. Um, thanks for the question. Uh, we have absolutely extreme polarization in the United States now. Um, and I think it's a result of some aspects of our political system, but also uh, social media is really what's driving it. And so we're gonna, we, you know, I think it's a, it's a profound problem that we're going to have to uh, address. Um, and the, um, the, the internet uh, companies are not taking their um, responsibilities seriously enough. They do it very reluctantly. Um, but, uh, you know, in terms of best practices, I mean, I think I would go back to, to, uh, to your, what you mentioned earlier, that, um, that cities um, in the U.S. can be tiny, they can be large, um, but we all um, have in common that we want to directly serve our people. And so together we can be, uh, we can find a lot of unity. The mayor, uh, Garcetti, Mayor Garcetti of Los Angeles has described how he will go to conferences and have long conversations uh, with other mayors and only uh, at the very end realize that, you know, one is a Democrat and one is a Republican because when it comes to, you know, the best way to uh, electrify a, a city using green technology or, uh, you know, deliver the trash in a timely way or um, use uh, light colored pavement uh, because that's better for uh, heat, you know, these conversations are not political. They are fundamentally practical. And that's what uh, mayors, uh, rural, uh, you know, small, smaller mayors and larger mayors have in common. Thank you. So going into a little bit more specific, uh, like the issue of uh, political climate change, what we have been witnessing in the region, especially in, in Hungary, is that uh, the police driving parties are under a growing pressure to fine tune their uh, communication and climate skeptic sort of uh, approach. Um, especially now that new uh, like groups and younger generations are coming into politics, getting more involved. So I'd like to ask Mr. Karacson, how would you capitalize on the support of, of these generations? I mean, Fidesz has been claiming for a long time that climate change is an elite conspiracy, but then all of a sudden uh, they just decided to take it over um, from the leftist liberal agenda. Köszönöm, mert nagyon fontos kérdés ez, és még egy pillanatra visszatérnék a polarizáció. Okay. Yeah, we have some slight delay with the English translation, but it's going to happen soon. Well, and this is that polarization, that this is that polarization that there should be polarization. Uh, this is the interest of, uh, of uh, uh, the uh, illiberal governments, uh, that, you know, there's a, uh, there's an opposition between youngers, uh, elders, uh, small cities uh, or, or cities and uh, small villages. If we look at the uh, result of uh, the Polish elections, and I think my friend Rafael could talk about that uh, in details. Now, this showed a, a lot of polarization along these lines, these social division lines, and therefore, if we want to defeat populism, we have to do our best in order to uh, strengthen the, in order to uh, fight back the uh, polarization, so to try to mitigate polarization. There are no perfect solutions, there's no silver bullet in this respect. But we in Hungary, for example, what we are doing is uh, that we are creating a very extended, wide alliance of municipalities where we have uh, the mayors of uh, small settlements, villages, uh, big cities alike, who are all fighting equally for uh, funding and for uh, the progress of their own settlements. We want to make it clear that this type of division line between municipalities and central uh, and the central government is not a division between Budapest and small towns or villages. And as far as climate change is concerned, yes, uh, there is a very, very strong um, division between generations. I was very much shocked to understand that uh, in Budapest, according to polls, um, among uh, the under 30 age group, uh, there is an 80% support. We have 80% support. 
while whereas uh, at the elder older age groups of Fides is being supported more significantly in Budapest so while we have to use the enthusiasm of youngsters of the youth because their political participation is inevitable in order to uh, to have a, a social joining forces against climate changes change but we it is also important at the same time to talk to the elder older generations we therefore would like to launch a separate program an individual program with a view to with a view to involving elderly, the elderly, because it, they are very much threatened by climate change. During the summer, um, the health problems uh, are really more um, affected more in, because of the heat, and we would like to win them over for this uh, politics. So again, polarization is just um, the um, the living uh, environment of the popul of the populace. We progressive Democrats, we will need to build bridges instead of walls. Thank you. Mr. Cheskovsky, the Polish government uh, did not really support the, the climate agreement. Uh, how do you see, how could Warsaw gain a political momentum and challenge this type of authoritarian populist governance, uh, like how to challenge it based on this newly emerging uh, green identity politics? Well, let me address, you know, both issues. Uh, as you know, I was a candidate in the presidential elections for the president of the republic and uh, polarization is something that we need to fight with because otherwise it is very difficult to reach out to the other part of the society which uh, uh, supports uh, the government. And I think that uh, sometimes liberal progressive parties were making that mistake of uh, basically being a bit too patronizing to all the uh, others who uh, chose uh, conservative or populist uh, parties. And now uh, it turned out that it's much easier for the mayors, for, for the local leaders, for the regional leaders to actually, uh, even in, in some difficult areas, to come and to discuss issues with the people. Uh, because it turns out that regardless of the fact whether you're mayor of the capital city of the big city or a small rural community, I mean, the problems are exactly the same. COVID, education, and also climate change. Uh, and that's why, uh, I mean, if you uh, stop being patronizing, if you simply start talking about resolving the problems and start talking about the real challenges that are before us, regardless of the fact whether you come from Warsaw or from a rural area, then you can actually start bridging the gap, reaching across the aisle, and then uh, being effective fighting uh, populists. Because, of course, populists are more uh, effective when they are dealing with difficult issues. Because if you have now... 30 sec seconds on the news or 160 signs on Twitter, and you're to discuss refugees, COVID, a climate change, of course you're going to be much more effective when you're a populist and when you're just reaching out for simple messages. Uh, then if you are uh, from a progressive party, when you are trying to uh, balance different, uh, uh, different arguments uh, and present uh, a coherent uh, policy and coherent solutions. But the most important thing is to be honest. The most important thing is to listen to the new generation. And I think that uh, the new generation, the young people, are very much concerned with climate change. And that's why when we talk about our ways of dealing with the questions, the solutions from the big cities, because, you know, we are at the forefront of fighting climate change because we produce the biggest amount of emissions. And if we show that uh, we are aware of the problems, that we find ways... Um, of uh, effectively dealing with them by greening our cities, by, by uh, prioritizing uh, public transportation, uh, by, create, by focusing on quality of life, where we think about people who move around in the cars, but also use public transportation, bicycles, or simply walk around, then we can prove that uh, we are in sync with what uh, the young people perceive rightly as one of the biggest challenges that, that, that is before us. So at the end of the day, it's courage. At the end of the day, is a, a conversation instead of uh, lecturing. And thirdly, and most importantly, uh, showing by example that things can be changed and that we are not just talking about a reduction, neutrality, targets, but we talk about some very concrete things, such as, you know, for example, taking the diesel uh, buses off the streets of the 
of the European cities. And that's where we need cooperation with the European institutions. That's where we need benchmarking and cooperation with other cities all around the world. That's what we are fighting for, direct access to EU money, because we think that if the European Commission and the European institutions will come up with those uh, European programs that are going to be uh, directed at cities uh, and, uh, you know, and then actually deliver results uh, by, as I've said, you know, focusing on one or two uh, objectives, uh, palpable objectives that we want to achieve, then we can uh, demonstrate effectiveness. And, and you know, uh, all in all, we can basically uh, achieve all of those results uh, with just one well-thought-out action plan. Fight populism, fight polarization, because we are really fighting with something that uh, touches upon our daily lives, regardless of who you vote for. And thirdly, uh, demonstrate effectiveness. And who, if not mayors, uh, can actually show that, that they're on the ground resolving the problems. Thank you. Just following up on what you have said about the importance of EU transfers, uh, I turn to Mr. Vallo now. Um, as far as I know, your, your city and the country in general could expect more transfers within the next multi-annual uh, financial framework, uh, despite that Bratislava is in the top 10 richest or most developed regions in the EU. Uh, I came all along from Warsaw, uh, where I moved two years ago, and the biking culture is just growing on me. And I love Bratislava, I think it's a terrific city, and no offense, but I haven't really seen any biking grounds all around. So what exactly is your green agenda when it comes to the city, and do you have any ideas how to upgrade this part? Thank you very much. I'm happy you like Bratislava, and of course, uh, the bike lines are something we, we need to work uh, work on uh, more and more. And it's also in my program, and it's going to happen. But of course, the the, the green issue or green view on our city is is more complex. Uh, we are having problem with limited access to EU funding, of course, because uh, we are qualified as a more development region. And this composed uh, a problem with our already unfunded budget. But uh, we're trying to fi find find a way. Uh, we have we have, we have different programs uh, we which are already in in uh, action. One very uh, program which is uh, let's say very safe bet, and it's we are planting the trees. We have this program. Uh, that we are going to plant a certain number of trees. It's 10,000 uh, in the next two years. It's not a lot, but it's, um, it's a good number it's from Bratislava. Our aim is to, to have these trees uh, in the place also 10 years after we are going to plant it. And we are also different. Uh, we are talking about the water, what's going to happen with the water in the moment which uh, fall down uh, in, in the form of rain and how we're going to keep the, the water in, 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 our, in our city and uh, how to use the, uh, this effect. We know that we are in the middle of climate change. If you like it or not, it's happening. So we have a problem with our drainage system. It's happening and uh, this, is, this is just two of the many issues we, we are trying to, to deal. With, and of course, there are uh, other things we, we are talking here in uh, Bratislava about and uh, the things how we uh, are going to use and uh, the concept of our, of our uh, garbage removals and all other stuff, which uh, there are many small parts which in the end uh, form uh, our, our, let's say, strategy for, for, uh, for greener and more sustainable city of Bratislava. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Maybe Zdan Akri would like to add something to that when it comes to inclusive ideas to overcome polarization and green agenda. Well, uh, I have to just agree with my colleagues uh, completely. The, the fact is, and we could see that right now in the COVID uh, situation, that some politicians actually do not try to solve the problem of polarization. They are actually surfing on this wave and they are abusing this phenomenon to get cheap political points. For example, our president in the current situation, the president of Czech Republic, 
uh, said something uh, in the sense, in the meaning that uh, the citizens of Prague are mm, guilty of spreading the virus to regions. And this is completely unacceptable thing because the the point is that the current situation is actually uh, a little bit worse in some of the uh, regions uh, that are outside of Prague in the Czech Republic. That's the first thing. And the second thing is that the fact that Prague has got the most... Uh, positive tested people for COVID-19 is pretty obvious because it's a city, it's a long, it's a lot of people on small space. There's a lot of contact between the people. So the cities are always uh, the most uh, and hardly hit ones in the situation in the pandemics like this. So uh, I think I have uh, nothing to add. I have to just confirm the words of my colleagues. Okay, thank you. We already have a question from Wojciech Przybylski here. If you could get the microphone, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so Wojciech Przybylski, uh, sorry. Hi, Wojciech Przybylski, uh, Visegrad Inside Respublika Foundation Warsaw. The question is, uh, for me, to the panel, you have a fantastic, especially V4 mayors, you have a fantastic opportunity to tell a different story about the Central Europe than we hear from the national governments. What concrete steps, what concrete uh, proposals can you put on the table as together to tell a different story and, and change the narrative of Central Europe, not only internationally, but also domestically, uh, about Central Europe, what this cooperation is all about, uh, bring you know, the, the right message about values, and priorities to the discussion on the region. Um, what, what, what did you discuss so far? Thank you, it's a terrific question. Who would like to come first to respond? Well, if, I, if, I may, if I may, I mean, of course, you know, we demonstrate that uh, local governments can be very inclusive, that they can be open, that they can be transparent, that they can be tolerant. But most importantly, I think we uh, can demonstrate that uh, Visegrad 4 it can again have uh, constructive ideas because what we observe now is simply Visegrad 4 on the defensive, uh, on the governmental level. Uh, I, we don't see anything positive coming out of the group. We, of course, see that they meet and that's good, you know, because, of course, they should meet and exchange information, but then they do not come up with anything which is constructive. And that's worrying, and that's why that was one of the reasons that we decided to get together and to demonstrate to, uh, to uh, our European colleagues that uh, there are still forces within uh, the Visegrad Four which are pro-European, which are constructive, which can come up with uh, positive ideas, such as, for example, fighting climate change, such as, for example, uh, getting uh, direct financing, which is, by the way, helping us to get out, out of this very schizophrenic situation in which, on the one hand, we want the European institutions to be tough when it comes to uh, defending the European values, because at the end of the day, uh, you know, this is what uh, binds us together in the European Union. But on the other hand, when um, uh, structural funds uh, are connected with the rule of law, then obviously, you know, it also creates problems for us, because... Uh, we do not want uh, the funding to be cut from the regional governments or from the cities just because uh, we have a populist government which decided to fight the rule of law. Uh, and this is basically what we want to do. I mean, we want to demonstrate to the others that there is still, you know, this, uh, uh, that there are those pro-European um, constructive forces within our countries and that not everything is lost. And I always do that, so you might have heard it, but, but we also want to demonstrate one very important thing quoting uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, we will be back. Thank you. Only because Hungary is also under Article 7, much like, like Poland, I would like to ask uh, Mr. Koracin to come in at this point. Yes, there is a huge debate uh, when it comes uh, to uh, the rule of law between the European Union and the government of Hungary. Uh, 
One of uh, the main essence of the cooperation of the V4 Capitals mayors is to make it clear to everybody that the Hungarian government is not equal to Hungary. And it is uh, not equal to uh, the leadership of Budapest either. A country is always comprised of various uh, partial interests. But uh, one of the most important weapons of populists is uh, to depict uh, the deconstruction of democracy uh, in a way that democracy is uh, basically just a series of unnecessary obstacles between the leaders of a nation and the population. Populists are always interested in presenting that, uh, that they represent the voice of the people, even within the European Union. And, as Rafael has already mentioned, the direct funding of cities would make it possible for the EU to uh, avoid a uh, uh, catch situation in order for it not to have to select between two negatives, uh, one being not sanctioning, not imposing any sanctions uh, upon going against the rule of law, or on the other hand, um, to impose sanctions upon nations due to the mistakes uh, made by the populists and therefore actually underlining the rhetoric of a populist, uh, namely that the government of a given nation, a given country, equals the nation, the country itself. We do not simply fight for our cities to gain funding, although that is definitely a very important objective. But it is equally important that uh, it become clear that uh, the given governments are not the same as the citizens of a given country. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rib. Um let me add a sort of a follow-up question to that um, and let me also play the sort of the devil's advocate here uh, because I think it's also important to point out that existing EU programs uh, like directed cities are quite underutilized uh, in our region. So for example, the urban uh, city, the urban innovation action has so far zero applicants from, from Poland and Slovakia and only one from Czechia and from Hungary. So how to how to make it more efficient and, and effective in practice? Because you're aiming to get access, direct access to these to the EU funds. But, but how to make it efficient at the end of the day? Well, of course, we would like to support innovations in our city uh, much more than we are doing now. But the problem is that we will face soon uh, very strong budgetary restrictions related to what I have said uh, before, to the compensation uh, related to uh, to the tax changes that in general means less money for the regions. But uh, I really hope that we will be able to uh, remain, to, to keep up at least some of the support for the innovations that also includes the counseling and support for other subjects to be able to ask for these uh, funds. So I really hope that we will be able to help them in this uh, effort. Thank you. So again, to observe these kind of localities in, in, from global perspective, I get back to Madam Ambassador, and I'd like to get back to her with the question, which is concerning, uh, based on your experience, how could exactly uh, a city like Los Angeles be helped out by activities uh, conducted by you expanding the economic and, and financial uh, sort of ties of the city? How could that help you in this matter? Um, well, it helps us in uh, a number of ways. Uh, we've been very active on the global stage under the leadership of Mayor Garcetti. Um, and it's funny, it was just striking me that we're, we're a member of a, a number of, of global networks, um, including the C40, which is the one that's focused on climate change, because as, our, as my colleagues have said, you know, cities have a lot of control over uh, carbon emissions and over the possibility of greening their cities. Um, and, you know, during COVID, we got a lot of 
we had a lot of just direct conversations city to city about uh, very specific, you know, questions on, you know, how are you feeding your, your elderly when they stay at home? And um, what kind of test did you use? Was it a PCR or an antigen test, you know, et cetera. Um, and uh, some of the cities, you know, represented here were, were part of those kinds of conversations. Um, but what is occurring to me is that the Pact of Free Cities is really a network of values. And that's actually not something that, uh, that, that uh, there isn't another one like that, that I know of at least. Um, and I feel very uh, comfortable in there um, being, being amongst them. But in terms of uh, economic ties, you know, we don't control, uh, <laughs> we don't control trade policy. Um, but we can help our small businesses uh, export um, and we can try to attract foreign direct investment to our city and uh, at a time when the American economy is not doing well to be able to have those ties with regions that are still growing um, it, you know is is a is of direct help to our city economically thank you um... Getting back to um, Mr. Rafarczewski, uh, at your introductory remarks, you mentioned that this is the 30th anniversary of, of local governance uh, in your country. And uh, there's a lot going on when it comes to changing regulation um, from the side of the government. And I was just wondering if do you accept, expect any uh, like uh, drastic changes when it comes to the regulation of the, of the multi-level uh, governance system in, in Poland? So do you think that there is an actual threat that the government is about to change the regulation in the upcoming month? Well, I'm going to share uh, two secrets with you. I mean, one secret is this. I mean, those guys really don't like us. I mean, those populists really have a problem with, with popular mayors uh, because uh, at the end of the day, they know that we're doing a good job. And secondly, a second uh, secret is, is uh, less uh, um, optimistic because, uh, unfortunately, uh, if you were to ask me three years ago, I mean, what would I expect uh, this government to do? I wouldn't have uh, guessed all the things that they've done. So uh, now I have to be a little bit more cautious. And I think that uh, when they are saying that they want a more centralized Poland, when they are actually undertaking uh, changes which are uh, limiting our prerogatives, when they are cutting away our money and when they are using political criteria in order to distribute EU money, I mean, unfortunately, uh, that's uh, the direction that they're taking. So at the end of the day, you know, we, we have to take uh, the words at, at, the, uh, at their fa face value and, and we have to prepare for the worst. But the good thing is that uh, the civil society in Poland is still pretty strong. I mean, the opposition is pretty strong. And we've seen this government and uh, many other populist governments all around Europe and all around the world actually back down when they see, uh, 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 you know, a strong pro protest from the people or from the local governments or from the opposition. And it happened in Poland on, on, on two or three occasions. For example, when this conservative government wanted to... Uh, limit uh, the uh, the uh, powers of uh, and 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 you know the the, the women's rights uh, the, uh, the outcry was so huge and the pressure from all of us was so huge that they decided to back down because they realized that it would cost them too much politically so at the end of the day this is a test for us all for our resilience that we stand united that we stand true to our values and that we simply do what the opposition should do oppose the guys with bad ideas and we should do it together and that's why uh, i feel very very comfortable with my friends and also with uh, uh, with uh, the uh, deputy mayor of los angeles because i know that they have similar problems with the federal government because at the end of the day you know we are much closer to the people and at the end of the day we are much more in sync with the people at, at the end of the day i think we can be effective in fighting the the the, the populists uh and uh, winning um, winning the ground 
Thank you. Uh, Mr. Valo, I know that the state of play is markedly different in your country, but could you just share with us like one flagship project or action plan that you came up with recently or that you're going to come up like soon, which is about to overcome like existing like sort of polarizations and being sort of ex inclusive in a sense that um, which would or sort of also overcome the, the, the gap between the, the capital and the smaller settlements? In the first place, I really like to see and have Bratislava, our city, as a role model for all whole country. I want to see the city strong and self-confident uh, to all stakeholders. Uh, and in this regard, we are building a constructive relationship with our new government. That's very important. Uh, I need to also add that if we have some, some big division lines or gaps in Slovakia is between uh, conservative government and, and um, and uh, uh, liberals. Uh, and I really like the idea, I like many ideas of Mary Rafael Terskowski, but I like this one about the bridge. Uh, and this, if you're talking about the, this opposition, uh, about the division lines and gaps and populism, I think the, 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 the idea of mayors as, as a bridge, the municipality as a bridge between different uh, group of citizens, or in this, in this case, in different values, uh, political values, it's very important and uh, this is very good because I think on this uh, many, also the many mayors I met during my uh, two years in, in, uh, as a mayor agree and, and that's very important. I mean, it's, if you are talking about uh, how, what can be our project uh, which helps to, to overcome, overcome these lines and to to bring people together is, of course, it's it's um, very important to talk about the, the communication. I mean, it's another project by itself, but it's it's so important. And this is against. Uh, I need to agree with my colleagues uh, that uh, sometimes the liberal media or liberal side tend to be very very patronizing, and uh, and it, and and it's very important to be able to express ideas, our ideas in a simple way, in a way which is completely accessible to any, any inhabitant of our cities. And that's very important. Uh, what is important uh, for me, of course, uh, in terms of some kind of real project is to bring people to, 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 to be a part of the process of, of change of our city. And we found it, uh, was one of my dreams, we found it an uh, institute, a think tank called uh, Metropolitan Institute of Bratislava. And we have a department of uh, participation there where we're trying to do the real participation, the, not the PR or marketing one, but the real one, which really brings people to important processes uh, of the city and we are listening to them. So this is very important for us. Thank you. So before we sum it up, I would like to ask the audience if there are any questions. I can see one hand over there. from the Association for Production and Use of Biofuels. Before they were mentioned uh, uh, by one of the Myers that uh, the goal should become uh, diesel-less transportation cities, so to take all diesel buses off the roads. Actually, uh, this opened to me uh, one large theme which is uh, connected to the climate change. Of course, we have to handle the climate change. One of the wars is transportation, which causes about a third of the emissions. And actually, we have here a wonderful precedence from Stockholm, which became fossil free, absolutely already today, uh, with the help of biofuels. So not taking out uh, the biodiesel buses out, just using different kind of fuels. And it meant also a large lowering, lowering of emissions um, um, emitted. Actually, uh, there is also in power now new directive from European Union, which says that it, uh, in the start of two, uh, 2021, it shall be almost third of acquired public transport machines acquired ecological. So uh, there are already invented precedences, there are already invented ways. What's missing is more uh, public financing, so help for the city, for the Myers, 
how to acquire these new technologies or at least how to change the existing transportation fleet for such new technologies. And there I would like to um, know from all the Myers whether they have some good experience uh, in relation or from connection to European Union when it on one hand says via directive to acquire ecological buses, if on the other hand it really uh, helps to promote them and to really acquire them because it's not, it's quite costly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, a very important question and this is very topical in case of Budapest. Now, if there is a less developed city or which can make a technological leap forward, then you know you can uh, be one of the first from the last one. And this is a, it's such a leap we are preparing for in Budapest. Now, what I inherited a very, very lousy bus park, a very, very obsolete bus fleet. More than 40% of uh, all the buses in Budapest uh, are diesel uh, proper buses which should have uh, been phased out long ago from public transport. But my feeling is that uh, the Hungarian government and also a lot of European institutions uh, do prefer electric proper or electric buses while this technology is not yet at a level to be uh, very um, um, safe in operation. So it would be very reliable in operation and Budapest would be very much interested in in uh, switching to biodiesel, uh, biofuels uh, or gas uh, proper buses uh, to go for pilot projects and we are very, very much willing to be partners in this respect. However, I have a feeling that the European Union rather favours electric buses. Thank you. Uh, awful so sorry, but we're just running out of time, so we have to sum it up here uh, with some positive food for thought. Uh, like, I think we could say that like, while democracy might be in recession globally, after this panel we can hopefully say that it might prevail or like, sort of like pro my, some, some progress seems to prevail uh, at least on a local level. Um, with the help of regional and cross-regional uh, cooperation. Uh, before we fully wrap it up, uh, some organizational announcements. Please don't go anywhere because there will be a panel discussion starting at five here uh, about the security cooperation between the EU and NATO. And in the other room, um, in the Habsburg room, it's going to be a roundtable discussion about the future of democracy in the post-pandemic world. Uh, last but not least, I would like to thank our fantastic panelists for their valuable input and please give them a huge round of applause. Thank you.